This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. Today we're talking with Francesco Sanapo of Dita Artigianale in Florence, Italy. Well, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I am your host for the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate all of you taking the time to tune in to these episodes. If you haven't yet subscribed to Keys to the Shop, I would highly encourage you to do so. All you need to do is hit subscribe (laughs) wherever you get your podcasts. Wherever you're listening right now, take a second, hit subscribe. Really makes a difference for the show, but it also, more than that, makes a difference for you because you get to be updated with all the new episodes, the Rate of Rise Roasting Series, the Short Format Shift Break Episodes, Founder Friday, and all of the main episode goodness. So go ahead and subscribe. That'd be awesome. And also share these episodes with a friend and your team if you can and spread the love. Now, I want to let you know that Keys to the Shop has been nominated uh, for a Sprudgy Award, the 13th annual Sprudgy Awards put on by Sprudge.com. Uh, award people uh, honors for various categories of coffee work. One of them is um, podcasts, coffee podcasts. And I would be honored if you would vote for Keys to the Shop. It's really awesome to have been nominated for this. You'll find a link in the show notes for this, but all you need to do is go to sprudge.com slash vote, and it will give you the form where you can select Keys to the Shop under the um, podcast category, and also vote for all of the other categories like Notable Roaster, Uh, notable coffee producer, best coffee film, coffee writing, and the list goes on. So honored to be in the mix of all these great people. So on top of doing this podcast, one of the ways that I love to serve you as coffee professionals is through consulting and coaching. Keys to the Shop Consulting is where I get to work directly with you to help you either start your business off on the right foot or help you take your existing coffee shop, your coffee business, and level it up, you know, improve the operations, improve your your management and the quality of your coffee. There's a lot of different ways that we can work together, and I would love to talk with you about what that might look like. If you're interested in hearing more about Keys to the Shop Consulting, simply reach out to chris at keystotheshop.com. We can set up a free exploratory call, talk about what you need and how Keys to the Shop Consulting might be able to help. Again, the email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, today's episode is brought to you by the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from the wonderful and innovative folks at Voga Coffee. The Ground Control Cyclops Brewer is really changing what we can expect from batch brewers. It's a new standard for consistency, quality, and through its SCA award-winning technology allows you, the operator, to extract an incredible range of flavors from your coffee that you previously might not have even known were there. It's a palate and eye-opening experience. Go check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee to learn more. It's not only next level batch brew, but it also makes tea, batched ice lattes, batch cold brew, So it gives you quality and versatility. So again, to learn more and get a Ground Control Cyclops Brewer in your store, go check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee. Today's episode of Founder Friday is brought to you also by the Pacific Barista Series. The Barista Series is all about creating a line of plant-based performance beverages for baristas and tested by the world's best baristas before it even uh, lands in your customer's cup. I mean, the reason why they are the world's leader in plant-based beverages is because of this value that they have. They are serving the community with each one of their plant-based beverages, and it shows in the final beverage. Stands up to the heat from steaming, produces amazing texture for latte art, keeps the balance of the flavor focused on the coffee. Your customers are going to love it. You'll love it. To get it in your store and try it for yourself, go visit them over at pacificfoodservice.com. Learn more there. Really, if you're looking to serve your customers the absolute best in plant-based beverages, then it has to be the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, today on Founder Friday, I'm excited to welcome to the show an icon of specialty coffee, taking specialty coffee in Italy to new places. And that is none other than Francesco Sanapo, who founded the company Dita Artigianale in Florence, Italy. Coffee is a family affair for Francesco. 
Um, he became aware of it early in his life as his father owned and operated a coffee bar. Eventually, Francesco discovered specialty coffee and started his barista competition career. By the time he was done with his career in 2013, he is a three-time barista champion of Italy, placing sixth in 2013 at the World Barista Championships in Melbourne. After this, he turned his attention to starting Dita Artigianale and working to mix that classic, historic Italian coffee culture with a new forward-thinking and progressive expression of specialty coffee. With three cafes in Italy to his name and a fourth one opening up in the spring of 2022 in Toronto, it seems like Francesco is just getting started. There's a lot that went into all of this, and that is what today's episode is all about. Discovering the story of how Francesco started in coffee, the lessons he learned, how his passions developed over the years, his introduction to specialty coffee, and the founding and building of his company, and what he has achieved and what he still yet hopes to achieve through its growth. And so I'm really excited to have gotten a chance to sit down with Francesco, and I hope that you really enjoy this interview. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with the founder of Dita Artiginale, Francesco Sanapo. Francesco, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Really excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's super. I'm super happy to be here with you, actually. It's uh, really, uh, I feel like it's a long time coming. I mean, you've been a figure in uh, just world uh, specialty coffee for quite a long time. I, I, I know, you know, the, the beautiful cafes you've created, the standard you've set for with your roastery and your, your coffee shops. And so I'm excited to sort of dive into how things got started for you. But this is kind of a family business for you. Um, you've got your start in coffee because your father owned a coffee shop. And I, I think this is just something that you kind of uh, grew up with, right? Yeah, correct. Correct, Chris. I started with my father and it was really hard. It was really hard because he never permitted me to touch the espresso machine. You can imagine. I was there dreaming to touch the espresso machine and to make an espresso because for me it was the most beautiful things in life in that age. And he was really rude and he never permitted me to touch the espresso machine because I was not barista yet. <laughs> that was uh, for many years I heard this... Uh, you know this phrase uh like you are not barista yet you are not barista yet and i have the nightmare with this um with this phrase with these words and uh actually it's it's super fun when i won the first time the italian barista championship i just uh, uh called him and i told him hey dad now i'm the best italian barista i can touch your espresso machine <laughs> he started to cry. It was super sweet. But uh, yeah, for me, it was how I start my career. It was exactly like that. Just go to help my father after the school and then grow up with him until when I was 20 years old that I decided to move away from the family business and start to build my career. And I moved to Florence where I start my alone career where I start to be the, the second assistant of barista. So I just cleaned the cup in the city center of Florence and then I become barista and then I decide to compete and then I build my own company as you know. In your career following working for your father's uh, coffee bar, you, you must have learned a lot of things while working for your father's coffee bar that you brought into that world that you are creating for yourself. I mean, as, as a 14 year old, uh, learning how to make coffee, um, especially in such a, a, what sounds like an intimidating atmosphere. Yeah. What, what was your experience there and what kind of things do you credit that time, uh, for teaching you that you kind of still uh -huh. use today or was instrumental for you? I think it really teach me the real value of a professional job like a barista. So it just uh, transmit to me that how important is the role of the barista in terms of uh, 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 brewing an espresso, but as well in terms of hospitality. So it was my, it, it built my basement, okay? And then, uh, well, 
I think uh, I took the best, uh, let me to say that I'm the right example of uh, how to continue the history. I mean, my father represents the history of Italian coffee, the story of Italian coffee, okay? Uh, so what I did as a new generation is took everything uh, of the best of the history and try to make it uh, beautiful again. This is my role actually right now. Okay, so, and my father leave me the basement of doing this beautiful job that I'm doing today. I respect the history, but I look for the new. I really, uh, let's say, understand the right value to be a barista. And this is what I transmit to my employees every day. Then the right uh, mix of looking for the new and taking the history and making it uh, fresh and beautiful again. What kind of things are you talking about making beautiful again? Italian? Yeah, nice, nice question, Chris. Nice question. Let me to explain. Uh, I think uh, Italy has such a great history in coffee, such a great story. Okay. Uh, we we know espresso thanks for Italy, okay? We talk about espresso and all the beverage behind this uh, this uh, cup, thanks to the Italian. The Italian invented the espresso machine. The Italian invented the roast approach on the espresso side, okay? But then and this they invented because they put on table full of, of a lot of knowledge, a lot of passion, and then when this became became industry so probably the passion went out and probably the new generation they stopped to study because they think that they are the best and probably it was true in the past but actually what i'm i'm seeing is that uh, us as italian we probably sleep on our history Okay, we don't we we didn't continue to study and to learn and to see how the things is changing, how the technology is changing, Chris, how the coffee is changing in the region country. So if we don't continue to study, we never discover all these new things and uh, we don't give respect to our history, to respect the history you need to study every single day to build the future. And that's exactly what I'm doing. When you talk about the history and studying the history is the key to continuing to build the future uh, versus the pause. And you said the, sl the sleeping on the history. At one point, that history was innovative and new and everything was new. All the things that yeah. the old Italian culture of barista and, and espresso now, at one point, that was their third wave. That was their progressive coffee, but it stopped. Yeah. And, the, and now you're saying, well, you know, let's keep going. Let's let's innovate. Let's think of what it can be. And as you became a barista, as you were able to touch the espresso machine, and then as a 20 year old, was that when you decided that? you understood enough about the traditional way of doing it and the history and you wanted to pursue something um, progressive and, and further. When, when did that happen for you? It's a different stage in my life, okay? So because let's say from uh, 14 to 20, I just tried to take the best from my dad. From 20 to 30, I was studying every single aspect behind this uh, beautiful work. And then uh, from 30 to 42, where I am right now, I'm just trying to, to build a dream, okay? And uh, when I'm saying uh, I wanna make the history again through my job, it's just that I wanna innovate and respond, answer to the needs of the final consumer and be respectful in every part of the chain. 
you know, and uh, this is probably my approach right now. And I don't know if I, I, I make, I made a clear message to to you and all the people who is listening this um, this podcast. But yeah, what uh, what happened to me was that probably the WBC make a big change. Okay, the competition side. I have to be very honest and say that the WBC helped me to be connected with a new world of coffee. Okay, the specialty coffee community make me. To understand that there is something else than only Italian coffee. Okay. So the specialty coffee give me the chance to see and meet new people in the scene, in the industry, with different approach, different way to think. And that's make my I just open my eyes and see, okay, look. There is many different ways to approach on coffee. Let's build mine. And mine is the Tertigianale. At the end of my WBC career, which was 2013. So 2013, this is the third time you've won the Italian Barista Championship. You were sixth place in Melbourne for the World Barista Championships. And you had taken on so much information from the community um, you said from 20 to 30, you were just trying to understand a lot of other, a lot of the coffee industry and is studying all aspects of it. And then this competition circuit happened where I'm sure, you know, as you say, this is where you started to realize just where coffee could go and how you could be a part of it and bring in uh, things from the Italian uh, heritage and, and bring it to the next level. So what did you need to unlearn First, when you were discovering this new world of specialty coffee, um, and especially with your competitions, there's such a eye-opening experience when you're in that kind of a, a culture in an environment outside of your own. It must have been kind of a culture shock to go from being so steeped in Italian espresso and culture to World Barista Championships, uh, all these different countries, and expressions of specialty coffee um, how did that first impact you yeah that's uh, you you use a really correct word it was a cultural shock <laughs> because when i just discovered that uh, we can make an espresso with a single origin <laughs> we don't need a, a blend when i discovered that uh, we can have the traceability and the transparent of every single part of the coffee that we are using that's for me was something like a shock really as you said because until that for us the espresso blend was a secret secret from the family who rose that coffee secret you cannot discover you cannot ask what kind of coffee they are serving to you that's something that when i just jump out of my of my country i saw that the people talking about a region okay and people talk about a region where the coffee was produced and the producer also the name yeah that's for me was something oh my god what i'm what i'm losing okay to don't study it and then i became a nerd so i start to travel in the region country try to understand and that was 2011 was my first origin trip okay and uh, believe me chris i took my luggage and i went to honduras without know what is going on when i was in the in the airport i was checking uh, uh, san pedro sula okay the city where i just arrived with my my fly and i discovered that is the most dangerous city in the world i said oh my god <laughs> probably i need to I need to find a solution, but then everything went perfectly. Okay, so I meet producer, I understand that things is changing from the region country. That was a big sign for me, because I I mean, if the the coffee is changing from the mother country, probably we need to adapt. We need to understand what is going on, and then uh, talking with the other barista. 
WBC, the World Barista Champion, is such a beautiful uh, aspect of our community because it doesn't matter if we win or not. I never won uh, the WBC, but for me, it was the moment where I can be connected with many other barista and we can create this synergy and this um, uh, combination that make the industry to go up, okay? And uh, absolutely, this was a shock that changed my life in a better way. Now, what I'm doing is exactly a mix of the new innovation things that I discover meeting people in a specialty coffee community and a mix of uh, what my dad teach me and what the history of Italian coffee leave to me, okay? Uh, that is exactly what I'm doing. It's a mix of everything to make my own story. This happened after your uh, competition year where you placed six, and you then in that same year founded the company. You started roasting. How did you take the first steps? I mean, after that, do you, you must have decided I'm, I'm not going to pursue competition anymore. Now it's time for me to start my own business. I've learned enough uh, to, to make this mine. I remember the, mo I remember the moment, uh, exactly the moment, the second. I remember when I was in the competition ar area, okay, be exactly before the announcement of the final, okay? So when they called my name, and uh, I just put up my trophy, okay? They called me, yeah, the sixth barista in the world is from Barista from Italy, Francesco Sanapo. I took the trophy, and then in this moment, when I took the trophy up, I say, I have to open my own business. I have to go back to Italy and decline my job. I was, this was the trip, huh? I, I have to go back to Italy, decline my consulting job to every roster where I work with, and everything that is not related with my own business, and then buy and roastery. Okay, that was the moment when uh, it was Stephen Layton announced announcement my name, and during the cheers, you know, during the this atmosphere, I just was my brain was thinking on the next step. Mm. In this specific moment, I just decided that my competition career is done. And I can start another type of uh, competition, which is building my own brand in Italy, which it was not that easy. And the day after of the announcement, I, I was in Melbourne, okay, where I sent an email to Brambati. Uh, Brambati is my roster machine, just asking for a quote for the 7.5 kilo machine. And uh, that was fun because it happened, everything happened in Melbourne. And then uh, after one week, I came back to Italy and I started my, my step. First, send a letter of demission to everyone and then uh, build my own company, which was for me totally new. What, what kind of challenges did you anticipate having to overcome as you switched and what things did you not anticipate? You said it was difficult. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I, well, I was a full of enthusiasm. And when I came back, I didn't really take every single, uh, every single difficulty in consideration, okay? I just came, opened the, the rostery, but then I realized that there is many aspects that I didn't evaluate, which is how to introduce in the market coffee that, first of all, tastes completely different than 99% of the coffee in Italy, okay? Second, the price. So my coffee costs high price. And third, which is, was the most difficult, I cannot compete with the other roaster and supply to every cafe, espresso machine, grinder, uh, cup dishes and cups and sometimes money, okay? So I cannot compete with this. And that's for me was, was very difficult because I, I understand that uh, in Italy to build a business take longer than what they expect. 
So I start to watch the situation outside of Italy and I start to work a little bit, but was not enough to pay my salary. Okay, so right now I have 50 employees, <laughs> but in that epoch, it was difficult to pay my salary. Um, and I, I have to find some extra job, you know, to, to keep the sustainability of my life. Then, when I realized that it takes longer and longer, I, an opportunity happened on my, uh, on my way, which is this beautiful location in the city center of Florence, where they offered to me to, to open a cafe there. It was not in my plan. Chris to open a coffee shop but then I realized that that was the only way to show to spread out what I'm doing to spread out my coffee my story you know it was not any other way to launch this kind of uh, new project in Italy and then I say okay so put all the money I have on table and ask bank as well and uh, I opened the first cafe. And there where I start, I start with, uh, and this was, I think, a very strategical uh, point because then uh, thanks to the cafe, I can, you know, create uh, the, my story in Florence, in my, not hometown, but my, my, the town that I adopt myself because I, as I told you, I came from South of Italy. And then uh, I just obtained the interest of many food lover journalists. And then, uh, you know, the Italian barista champion opened his own cafe. That's the sound was very strong and useful for all the, all the press. And I, I just obtained more people to, um, to just, just open the question mark and make them to come in. And that moment I can introduce my cafe to them. And that was how we change, okay, the, the company to from roaster, what we are, to roaster and cafe, okay? And we can control every single aspect from the sourcing coffee until the, uh, the serving, okay? So this will, for me was very important in that moment, but very hard, Chris, very hard as well. Through your cafe, as you're showing people what you want them to see as the new way of doing Italian coffee, um, you uh, you have to get feedback to the roastery about what you're roasting and how it's working and what people are saying about it. Um, what was the impact that this had on the community, the local community, uh, in terms of, you know, this is more expensive, it's new, uh, did you get some some good and bad feedback? How did that work to kind of sh guide the way that you roasted and the way that you operated your cafe in the first couple of years? Yeah, uh, okay. So the price issue was the most uh, difficult things because you mentioned, and it's correct to say that uh, we, we put the espresso one euro 50, which is in that moment was the most expensive coffee in all area of Florence, okay? Or Italy, let's say, because mm, the espresso average in Italy is one euro, still one euro 20, okay? So the people was, was very upset when they came in and they just saw the price of espresso is one euro 50. I remember a guy who came in front of my face telling me the mo a lot of bad words <laughs> about that okay so he called me mafioso he called he, he just told me you will close the door of this cafe in one week in a six months he said oh my god it was at the beginning of my business i was super scared about that but fortunately we're still alive actually i saw him after six months and uh, i came out of the cafe i invite him to come in and i offer him the cafe and I explain why we uh, the price of our cup is uh, is higher. And right now is my best client. And when he come in, he always ask which is your best choice today. And he's able to pay 
three euro. So this is very, uh, very fun, but uh, very funny, but is uh, is a, is a beautiful story to share with you. Uh, regarding the all the other aspect, except beside beside the price, I can tell you that uh, we spend a lot of energy to explain to people the different flavors, okay? Because it's not only about the price, but as well, imagine the, the Italian people, they are used to drink coffee, which is roasted dark, which is as robust inside. And uh, they use two, uh, two spoon of sugar in every single cup. So we try to educate people to, you know, to, to understand a different uh, uh, way to accept to to do coffee and to do that we ask them to don't put the sugar in our coffee and we tell them where the coffee comes from we tell them uh, the every single step in every single sip we divide espresso in three sip and we teach we share with them the the flavor in every single sip this was a a big effort from our side to share with the consumer the new trend of coffee. Then when I go back to the roastery, I cannot uh, uh, give, uh, because all the feedback we receive, hey, we want more dark, we want more bitter, we want more uh, robusta, because that was out of our mission. I'm always saying we have to listen what the consumer say, because it's very important, but in the same time, we need to respect the mission of the company. And my mission was to introduce a new things of coffee in Italy. So of course, it's not the easy things, it need more time, but then when, when you will get there, it will be successful, okay? So we try to introduce new things. New things need time. And uh, my feedback to the roster, which was me, and I was the barista most of the time as well. So it was a communication between me and myself and my brain. Uh, but yes, I never, I never uh, roasted dark because the people need the dark roast because I don't want to burn the gem I found on my sourcing program, okay? And then I never use a coffee that was below 85 point so that's why there is no reason to use a, a robusta just to make the consumer happy and i never accept to have the two the two option because most of the the people at the beginning of my business they suggest hey look do that put one espresso at one euro with the robusta and then you put specialty at one euro 50 or two euro this doesn't work because it's like having uh, one foot in two shoes, okay? So it doesn't work, it doesn't, you cannot walk. It's impossible if you have uh, one vision, one mission, one strategy to have the, the plan be there, you know? So the, because that was more difficult for everyone, for the customer to understand what we are doing, the message will never be clear. And as well for me that I have to sell specialty, but I have to keep, the way to sell Robusta or what the people want. So I always refuse to jump on this approach and straight on my way, it was difficult, Chris, I have to tell you, it was not easy, but then we are here. I have a three cafe. I'm going to open the new one. So it's okay. That's it's a part of my journey. How much of this in how much of your ability to handle the criticism in the beginning is a, a result of your history in coffee as somebody who grew up same as those folks even more so because you were a coffee professional in the old way of making coffee and now that you're trying to do something new i you, you can understand where they're coming from you can understand what they're thinking which I imagine makes you able to think, I changed. I, when, I, when I went from the old way to the new way, I loved it. And I think that they can do it too because I did it. Was there some of that that kind of entered in as you weathered those challenges in the beginning? 
I can divide this uh, in two different uh, answer. Uh, one is uh, uh, when I saw professional a barista who came to me and tried to start a conversation and they came with approach, hey, I know everything. I don't have to, you don't have to teach me anything because I'm barista from 20 years. And I saw myself in his, uh, in their approach, okay? But uh, all the time, every time I have to explain to, to every barista who, came, who come with this approach that uh, all what we learn in history as 10% of what we can learn in the next future. So, and I try to make, uh, to, to push some stimulant, to push some bottom, to make them interest to discover a new world. Then uh, related with, the, and I think they can do because I, that was the, the key that make me interest to learn more, okay? When I saw that there is a lot page that I didn't study yet, when I saw that there is a lot of things to learn, so that's make me, you know, in the position to reevaluate all my experience and to become again student. And uh, I did, and I know how to make the others professional around me to, to be curious, to open the question mark at least. And then the consumer. The consumer is another capital, you know, is another topic. Because for that is the difficult part, I think, because when the people are used for 50 years, okay, to drink the same coffee, to listen the same story, like the, the blend is secret, like when you put the sugar on the crema, the sugar keep there for one minute, keep on top. Uh, there is many, you know, rules stupid rules actually that doesn't have any correlation with the quality okay uh but to explain to the consumer how this work it's a journey that is still working on okay uh what we are doing we are uh, try to be not teacher okay because we don't want to uh, make the consumer to feel that they don't know what is coffee. We try to be more a person who want to share. And then uh, we use every single harm in our hand in this epoch, like social media, like a podcast, like uh, actually I'm presenting a new TV show, national TV show in Italy to talk about coffee and show them the coffee scene in the region country which is a big successful because coffee never, never been in television until now. So it's a, you know, it's a, a communication side. It's a communication strategy because I know that can be possible, but we need to use all the arm in our hand to make a hundred year of history, okay? And to change it right. in a new world, which is, uh, our world, specialty coffee. Mm, that's great. And patience, patience is the key, right? Yeah, um, correct. So now as you built this first shop and got everything off the ground, you expand to store number two, store number three. How did this happen? Um, and did, how did you scale the experience from the first store successfully to the next couple stores this is a very i'm always share with my my team okay that sometimes i'm very frustrated i'm still very frustrated because when i when we opened the first store i was the one who were doing everything in the in the bar so uh, as well roasting the coffee as well doing every single step every single aspect of uh, my business and right now that uh, we have three store i don't have time anymore because i have to do many other things going from bank to the all the other business i am doing and uh, sometimes i saw 
um, some mistake, which is for me is frustrating because I can sometimes I cannot accept this mistake, but uh, I understand that I will I cannot fall on the first the second the third cafe like I did in the first, but I have just to trust my my team and training my team. Training it become my obsession right now on the training my team. I mean, I want to have the best barista behind the bar because I know how important they are. I want to try to reduce every single mistake that can happen in the op daily operation in the cafe. Okay, I want to serve always the best espresso, but this is the hard work that we are facing right now. Because when everything was under control by my side, I fell relaxed because you know, I know what I'm doing, but right now that I have a very good team, to be honest, I have just to transfer all the knowledge to them and make them to do their own mistake because as I did in the past, but as well to put the same passion to, you know, to continue the mission, the mission of the company. Growing is something that you, of course, you are going to face with this. It's not something that you cannot. It's very hard. It's very difficult, but we are doing, I'm doing my best to reduce every single mistake that we come from not having me behind the bar. And training is the key word. So hiring the right people, best people, training them well. Correct. And you used to be able to see if there was something wrong and fix it. But now you have to, do you have to wait until somebody tells you that something went wrong? How do you, how do you get word back that there is an incongruity or there is a, there is a problem with consistency or is it customer complaints? Is it the managers who, who tell you about it? We have the structure and the organization that help us to control and uh, it's the type of protocol we have. I, I have a meeting every single week only with the store manager who related to me everything what happened in the store during the week. And we also read the, the review if, they, if we have a review, but in any case, we we touch every single aspect of all week, okay? Uh, right now I'm in charge to, to be there one time a week with all of them. Probably for the, in the next year we jump one time a month with me and they, they will continue to have one time a week by themselves. Um, yeah, we analyze everything, but as you say, we hire very good and talented people. I totally trust them. And I have also to accept that it's not me behind the bar anymore. This is a, is a growing personal part, you know? And um, of course, sometime we can, I can read some bad review in, uh, in Google or whatever, and uh, I, I just become upset. But in the same time, I have to completely, I have to listen to my team why this happened because probably can be a mistake from the management. Probably we put one person less during the service, and this created the the um, the issue. But yeah, everything has to be analyzed, okay? And I have to be to take out from my side, the emotional part. And uh, this is my challenge, uh, Chris, right now. So my challenge is to make my team to work in a, in a good way, in good atmosphere, and to give them all my trust because there is knowledge behind. And what I'm doing is to serve them knowledge, knowledge every single day. So we, we have a beautiful training program for all of people who come and start to work with DITA. So we opened recently the Scuola del Cafe exactly for this reason. So in the new cafe, we have this new building that is fully dedicated for teaching people about coffee. Okay, 
and we invest a lot on that. This is the sign. And if we do, if we did that, it's because we want every single person who come in Ica to work, to understand the mission of the company and why we are here. Your investment into your people is obviously a passion and the personal growth that you're talking about of separating yourself from um, the idea that you have to be the one doing everything. It seems like it would be pretty disappointing at at some points to know that you can't be as closely involved in the thing that you you grew up being so interconnected with. How have you managed to overcome the emotional hurdle of separating yourself from the thing that you love so much, like the working the, the bar and everything, to just being the person who resources and facilitates others' success? Well, let's say that sometimes they permit me to <laughs> make an espresso. <laughs> they allowed me. <laughs> okay. So I, it's super fun because when I go to the cafe and, you know, I just jump behind the bar, which is, is very rare right now. But when it happened, I saw the people, they are happy. And I realized that this is like something that uh, for also for our team, it's important to see the way how I communicate with the consumer. Okay. Because uh, I don't say how I make the espresso shot because they are much better than me, Chris. Right now, they they, they are talent. I have barista who are very um, nerd, okay? But the way how I present our our cup of coffee to the consumer, this probably is the, the most different part of our, um, of our, of my approach. Uh, but then, yes, you're right. We need to to do to have a different approach, okay? Because uh, we need to give the the control and the chance to others to to build their career as a barista, as I did. And in the same time, my mission is to make this my my role right now is to make this this company to grow up, okay? To grow. And probably is more efficient if I go to look around uh, another city to go and check for the best location to open the new cafe. Okay. Uh, of course, I'm not making an espresso and serve to the consumer, which is I like it where I start. But right now, my role is probably to build the future in an other way because I have the team who know how to how to do it, who know how to, to serve the espresso. So probably I have to use my time in a different way, okay? So right now, for example, the production of these uh, coffee series, what we did was taking a lot of my time as well. And uh, if we did this, it was just, you know, to continue spread out the brand and make our cafe more... Um, more appreciated of course, or more Google it or more searching for, it, you know, what you're saying, uh, what I was thinking was you, when you said, I'm not making an espresso anymore, but you know, going out and searching a location and doing all of those things is preparing an espresso, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's distribution uh, in a, in a sense. And so now, it's not just Italy, you know, you are expanded to and set to open your first international store in Toronto. Yeah. You've been back and forth uh, between Italy and Canada and um, obviously putting trust in your people and the operations and, and being in the role you're in allows you to do that. Uh, tell us more about that project and, and what's gone into the preparations because that in controlling the the experience and the quality and, and all of that between an ocean is difficult. Yeah, okay, let me to say that uh, if we did this uh, jump, it's just because we, we really trust our partner there. Because at the beginning it was not, 
looking for. It's not the business that I'm looking for to open in the United States or Canada or whatever. But then it was a long conversation, okay, that took years, okay? And, um, and then when we realized that there is the base to open a discussion, it's just because it's based on trust, okay? And I really trust my partner there. It's something that we will control from our side. So we will control everything from design, from the people we hire, from the menu, okay? So this make me in a, in a position where I feel relaxed that this will be a very successful cafe. Of course, it's an effort, okay? We need to spend time there. I need to sacrifice some part of my team here in Italy and move them to Toronto. Uh, it's, it's an effort. I'm excited. So we are doing something to see how we build the next future. And at the same time, we are already built a strong basement to make it successful because we found an amazing location. So I cannot look for something better than where we are. And then uh, we are working with a nice team there. So it's, a, it's something that I didn't expect, but right now that we have, I'm excited for. You have probably had opportunities to expand beyond the stores that you've, uh, you have over the years, and you've chosen to stick with the three locations. And this one is, even though it's so far away, you said born from relationship and trust, and it took time. Um, but a lot of people, especially with your pedigree in competitions, your notoriety, could expand to 12 stores, 15 stores, uh, by, you know, over the course of years from 2013 till now. And yeah. I, I wonder about, you know, the philosophy you have on coffee retail and retail stores and expansion and and how you view that, because a lot of people are, you know, maybe I would argue expanding too fast. And, you know, wh where do you stand on this? If, if you saw, Chris, we, we are very slow, actually, because uh, some of my competitor, they just born, uh, uh, they are younger than me in a, in a business, but they open more cafe than me. We, we are slow because we try to make an healthy grow. Okay, I built this company from zero and uh, I really scared to destroy it. Okay, so every, everything I do, I just think how this can affect the next future. Uh, let me to give you an example. If uh, for any case, Toronto will fail, okay, our company doesn't risk uh, economical crisis. Of course, it's not good. And, that's a, nobody want, but everything is, uh, it was built to support an healthy growth. And Toronto is an example. Um, where I see the, my retail business is, of course, I want to open more cafe because I want to spread my brand all over the world and share my coffee with many consumer in uh, Florence, Italy, or Milan, or uh, Rome, or another city in the world, okay? But everything has to be connected with the growth of the company. Because if right now, for example, we are changing the, the roasting facility, so we are moving the roaster. For me, this is a big priority, it's a big growth. So until we don't move that, we cannot think about other, many other, retail store okay so this year we move and invest on the um, uh, web shop okay so this is is part that we are taking care and growing up we are trying to differentiate every all the business and try to make it successful and sustainable and healthy but anyway i want to open more store <laughs> one day day by day yeah that is the goal 
And regarding the old sale to other cafe is part that we are looking for and we are growing as well, but uh, control every single step of the chain before serving the cup, it make a more sustainable business. Difficult without any dubs, but sustainable, yes. Mm. Well, I'm really thankful for your philosophy on that and how um, thoroughly this has been thought through just from the very beginning and the evolution of your career from you know, the 14-year-old barista to having your eyes opened in specialty coffee to taking all of this effort and heart to uh, change the way that coffee is perceived and consumed in, in Italy and now you know beyond. Um, it's, it's really admirable. And so I'm, I'm grateful for, for what you've accomplished. And I'm also grateful for you joining me on the show. It's really been a great conversation. Um, where can we learn more and stay in touch with you and what's going on? And this, uh, I know this opening for Toronto is supposed to uh, happen in spring of 2022, I think. Okay. So everyone who is uh, listening to this podcast has a free coffee in our store in Toronto or in Italy. Okay. So they just have to come to my store and say, key to the shop and, uh, and they have, uh, and they, and they have a free coffee, okay? So this is my promise to all the people who is listening to this podcast. Um, yeah, we are going to open in May, May 2022. And, uh, well, just keep in touch with us following our official page of the Tertigianale. So there we will announce every single uh, every single communication about the company. And then my personal Instagram as well, Francesco Sanapo. And um, on our website, www.dtartigianale.it. So you can see everything what we are doing and our philosophy as well. Francesco, thank you again so much. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope uh, to help coffee to be more nice in every single aspect, not all, only in the final cup, but in every single aspect that make this product magic and beautiful as it is. Thank you, Chris, really. Well, everyone, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation and that you took away some good lessons from his experience especially the idea of making sure that what we build is healthy, is sustainable, is, is the best it can be for the customer experience, for the staff experience. And as he's grown in his career as a professional, he, he sees his, now his work as setting up others to be able to create these possibilities in specialty coffee. As operators, as leaders, this is the kind of thing we do. We facilitate the success of others, and it's no less important than standing behind the bar and serving coffee directly to the customer. And I'm so thankful that uh, Francesco was able to stand by his values in the midst of you know people's reactions to the types of coffees he was serving. Um, I love his analogy about you know having one foot and two shoes, and it, it, it's really fitting, uh, or or not fitting. Yeah, it depends on how you look at it, right? <laughs> so. A big thank you to Francesco for uh, joining us on the show. If you want to stay in touch with what's going on over there in Florence and beyond, you can just go to their website, ditaartiginale.it. You can also follow them on Instagram, at ditaartiginale, as well as uh, Francesco's personal account over on Instagram. That is at Sanapo Francesco. And of course, we'll have links to all of those in the show notes, um, as well as any uh, videos of Francesco's past competitions that I can find online. And uh, yeah, if you're in Italy, also you know, look forward to that series, that television series that Francesco is putting out there. So if you have any questions, comments, or feedback from me about this episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, feel free to email me, chris at keystotheshop.com is where you can do that. If you're interested in working with Keys to the Shop, consulting for barista training, elevating your coffee retail experience for your customers and for your staff, or if you just want to start your coffee business on the right foot, reach out to me via email at that same address, chris at keys to the shop. Dot com. And with that, that is the end of today's episode. Thanks everybody for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe to Keys to the Shop. 
on whatever your preferred podcast platform is. It would be awesome if you would vote for Keys to the Shop over at sprudge.com slash vote uh, for best coffee podcast. And uh, I just am thankful for all of you. It's been a wonderful year and uh, what a great episode to end our Founder Friday run for 2021 on great episodes coming up for the new year. And I'm really looking forward to it. Have a great day. And of course, as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.